What does the mayor say when the clock is running out? With just 23 days left in office, Mayor Mike Duggan is reflecting on a dozen years leading Detroit and what comes next. Here's more from Fox News' Brandon Hudson. I want you to know I uh, wore this tie in honor of you. <laughs> <laughs> Detroit Mayor Mike Duggan started with a little humor as he took his seat for his exit interview. The Detroit Economic Club hosted the forum Monday. For an hour, Duggan talked about his biggest challenges from the city's 47,000 abandoned homes and the bankruptcy, which contributed to an exodus of businesses. When I came in, it, it wasn't just a function of the city had a financial problem. The city was operating operationally uh, non-functional. To Detroit's triumphs, improving the Riverwalk, using green light cameras to cut down on crime, and partnering with anti-violence groups to make communities safer. When I started, it was 400 homicides, got down to 300, 200. We are at 160 now with a few weeks to go. It is because we have great management and they have partnered with a group of violence intervention groups from the private side. Duggan touted the success of hosting the 2024 NFL Draft in downtown. He also shared a story about the event, which almost derailed one of the most successful drafts in history, and how a phone call to AT&T saved it. Two hours before they were to open the doors at the NFL Draft, all of the cameras went dark. Uh, seriously, the police headquarters called. Chief White says, what the hell? He says, I can't see a thing. I was not aware that somebody building the Water Square Apartments down the street lied and shut down our cameras, okay, Gary? I didn't know at the time it was you. Uh, but <laughs> and so my team is panicked. Mayor Duggan believes he's helped change politics in Detroit forever. He said there's no longer that us versus them mentality, and there's more of a sense of unity. As for his successor, Mayor elect Mayor Sheffield, Duggan believes that she will do a great job in office. In Corktown, I'm Brandon Hudson, Fox 2 News. The Edge at 11 starts now. Tonight on The Edge, big decisions ahead for Southfield. Two big projects on two opposite ends of town. Let's get live to Fox News' Lauren Edwards. She's in Southfield City Hall with the details from tonight's special council meeting. Lauren, a lot at stake here. A lot at stake, and I can tell you within the last hour, they officially ended. And next week, next Monday evening, is public comment on that data center. But it's also going to be a lot more public comment as well on the Costco proposal, which has got a lot of people talking. Let's get into all the information and details that you need to know. Now I can tell you the Costco representative, Steve Cross, is one who came in and mainly spoke, saying it's already a 450,000 square foot site on 23 acres, and they're looking to re redevelop the whole property at 100 and 200 Galleria Office Center along Lockdale Street and Northwest Highway, which will include a wholesale warehouse store and a fuel station. City Council asked about a range of topics like traffic, which Cross says, you know, there will be some widening on Northwest Highway to help with that, to demolition, which Cross also says that they aim to cover. He says all around Costco should be good for Southfield's economy. Obviously, Costco brings uh, retail, brings jobs, curbs the retail leakage, generates taxes and significant disposable income in the community. We're also involved in the community, and we certainly provide the necessary services within the facility itself. Now, if all goes well and everything is approved and the public comment is had as well, then we could see demolition on that site begin next summer, summer 2026. And again, though public comment was not tonight, it will be next Monday, again, on the data center, but also on uh, Costco as well. Reporting live here in Southfield, Lauren Edwards on the edge. Just, just kind of getting a pulse from what you're hearing from the people who are sitting there, the people who are, live in that area, which seems to be more, a more favorable option at this point, not that there's one or the other, but the Costco or the data center, what seems to be getting a lot of buzz? I can tell you, honestly, it's more so the data center, and I think just because a lot of people just are more so wondering what it was, and it's also dominating a lot of headlines, right? We covered all the protests happening in Howell, all the protests happening in Saline Township, so they're wondering what could this mean here, but again, I'm hoping that we're here next Monday so we can hear all about it from the residents, what they're concerned about most. Yeah, you better believe we'll have a camera there for sure. It's an important story and such an important town here in Metro Detroit. Lauren Edwards for us live tonight. Thank you. And as you mentioned, in Howell Thank Township, 
Lauren, the future of that proposed data center is up in the air at this hour. Developers of the $1 billion facility pulling the plug on the project for now. They withdrew their rezoning request ahead of tonight's township board meeting. This comes after residents voice environmental and energy cost concerns. The family who owns the land say they want to give residents and the township more time to develop regulations for any future data centers. A deer in Novi was feeling confident in the cold weather. Look at this. One of our producers, Nikki Sterling, catching the curious deer digging around snow near her front door overnight. Hey, Steph, what do you think? Will there be more snow to shovel tomorrow morning? And can this little guy help us? Uh, you know what? I do think we have more snow that we'll be tracking for sure. It's also going to be cold as well. So we still have a very winter-like pattern here over the next couple of days. Uh, the snow arrives as early as 8, 9 o'clock in the morning. This first round of snow is going to give us a potential of maybe one, one and a half inches. Then a second round of snow, potentially late Tuesday into Wednesday. And we're not tracking much now, but it's not too far away from us here. We have snow in Wisconsin, Minnesota. They have several winter weather alerts there. Nothing for us here locally, which is great. That first round of snow should be out of here by around four o'clock in the afternoon. So the evening drive might be a little tricky, but I think manageable. We're dry through about 10, 11 o'clock. Then that second wave of snow, potentially rain too, arriving just before midnight. This is our picture by 2 a.m. Steady snow showers. We'll see it transition over into rain and then potentially seeing it transition back over to snow late Wednesday as it gets colder behind this area of low pressure late Wednesday into early Thursday. Now, our snowfall totals are nothing super impressive. I think about an inch from that first wave of snow and then that second wave can give us an additional two inches. So when it's all said and done early Wednesday morning, I think around one to three inches of snow looks to be what we'll see. 17 right now downtown our low temperatures tonight will be in the mid to upper teens temps moving forward to remain near seasonal tomorrow and Wednesday we'll see a rain to snow mix and then much colder behind that next system with additional snow chances taking us through this upcoming weekend Roop over to you find new details coming to light in the case of a murdered northern Michigan mom. Court documents allege that Rebecca Park's mom and stepdad tortured her while trying to cut her baby and then put the infant inside a lunch cooler, tossing it in the trash. Park was missing for three weeks before police found her body in a wooded area. Courtney and Bradley Bartholomew are both charged now with kidnapping and murder. They're expected back in court tomorrow morning causing the problem. They did their best to de-escalate the situation and have him move on, but they couldn't do so, and ultimately he took it to a whole other level. A local dad in trouble with the law after he allegedly rammed his car into a Sterling Heights High School principal and safety officer. Prosecutors say 45-year-old Lemuel Young was blocking the bus lane at Bemis Junior High School and hit the victims with his car when they asked him to move. Now Young is facing felony assault charges. Two people had to be rushed to the hospital after a house fire in Farmington Hills. This happened early Saturday morning, and now we're learning more about who is involved and who's still missing. Fox News' Dave Spencer joins us live from the scene of the fire with the very latest. Dave. Yeah, Rupa, at least one of the two people who was involved in this house fire, this house that you see behind me, is still in the hospital recovering. Now, I was able to speak with the family of Leah Zorin. She was one of those two people inside, and they say that just now she is being able to regain her ability to speak. And the first thing that she said was, where is my dog, Bella? And if you look at the pictures that were provided to us by the Farmington Hills Police or Fire Department, you'll be able to understand why flames could be seen shooting through the roof, causing that roof, in fact, to collapse at a house on 10 mile near Middle Belt around 2 Saturday morning. That's where they found Leah and a man who had lived there. They were already on scene. According to Leah's family, after she escaped the fire, she panicked, learning that her dog, Bella, and four cats were trapped inside. They say even though she was safely outside the fire, she frantically tried to get back in and rescue the trapped animals. Eventually, the smoke became too much for her. She needed to be treated at the hospital along with that man. But Lee's family said she tried all she could to rescue those pets. She says um, the, the doctor had told us that he, she has three very bad deep wounds on her forearm because of um, uh, different wounds from punching through the glass. She apparently got herself out uh, first and then um, because uh, I guess um, there was the fire just was severe, then she immediately uh, went right back around where the animals were and she punched through this one window and um, cut herself up pretty bad. Um, and the way that she explained it, she was able to save 
this one cat that was there right away, but the dog, for some reason, ran back into the house, and that was the last time she saw the dog. Now, the fire department did say that they were able to recover the body of three dogs and, I mean, rather, three cats and not the dog, which is why the Zorn family has hope that their dog, Bella, is somewhere out there. In fact, they're offering up a reward of $500 for anyone who happens to come across this dog, any neighbors that may be watching, or maybe perhaps the dog got uh, so scared and ran a greater distance away. Uh, we'll have a link on, on fox2detroit.com. If you do have the dog, Bella, you know where she is. Uh, you could find uh, how to get in contact with the family and claim that $500 reward. As for Leah and her recovery, she's going to be in the hospital for a little longer as she recovers from the smoke inhalation, but mainly they say it is the, the injuries to her arm from breaking the glass and, and trying to rescue that those animals that is going to be the longest of this. Uh, record, reporting live tonight in Farmington Hills, Dave Spencer on the edge. Yeah, people can listen to this and say, well, that seems like a, finding a needle in a haystack, impossible, such a small dog could have ran away but we know uh, if neighbors look out and they listen and look closely it's possible they can still find this dog if the dog made it out of the house I mean, we do stories all the time about how families are reunited, sometimes years after, and these dogs will travel thousands or sure. hundreds of miles uh, before that happens. So there is still hope, and that's what this family is clinging to right now. Now, let's hope that they find Bella soon. Of course, we'll keep everyone updated. Dave Spencer for us live tonight. Thank you. He preys on young girls, and that will be his MO for the rest of his life. A Berkeley man will serve prison time for sex crimes against minors. Darren Bradford was sentenced today to 2 to 15 years in prison after pleading guilty in one of several cases. This one was in Gross Point Park where he assaulted a 15-year-old girl in his vehicle. Bradford was given jail credit for about nine months already served. He also faces charges for alleged assaults in Bloomfield Township and in Berkeley. More political drama unfolding in Hamtramck. The city now faced with yet another lawsuit, this time from a former city clerk. Rana Farage is suing the city and its officials, claiming she faced retaliation and was placed on administrative leave after alerting the attorney general's office and Wayne County election officials about suspected election fraud back in November. Several officials, including the former mayor, city manager and city council members, are named in the suit. This is just another rotten episode of, of Hamtramck politics. My client, Rana, serves as the city clerk. She's responsible for elections. And unless you've been living under a rock, you've heard about all this election misconduct and unfair election stuff in, in Hamtramck, going from stuffing ballots in the mailboxes so much that they can't get all the fake ballots in. Farage is seeking her job back as city clerk, compensation for damages, and court orders requiring the city and its officials to stop retaliating against her. Obviously, the first thing is to vet and check out the dating app that you're actually on. How setting up a date through an app turned into a disaster. What we all need to look out for is still ahead on the edge. Also, the Lions are spreading holiday cheer this season by taking kids on a shopping spree. Hear from wide receiver Amon Ross St. Brown on what this means to him and the other players. Next.